Now turn to section 1. Section 1. You'll hear a man calling a catering company. First you have some time to look at questions 1 to 5. You'll see that there is an example which has been done for you. On this occasion only, the conversation relating to this will be played first. Hello, five-star caterers. Can I help you? Oh, yes. I spoke to you an hour ago about the arrangements for our end-of-term party. The man is calling about a party, so party has been written on the form. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions one to five. Hello, five-star caterers. Can I help you? Oh, yes. I spoke to you an hour ago about the arrangements for our end-of-term party. Oh, that's right. It's Mr. Saunders, isn't it? Actually, it's Sanders. That's S-A-N-D-E-R-S. Oh, I'm sorry. I'll just get that down correctly on the form. Okay, Mr. Sanders, sorry about that. No problem. Well, I've got the details you asked for, so I thought I should call you back quickly and book. Good. Let's fill in the form, shall we? Great. First of all, can you give me a telephone number? Somewhere where you can be contacted during the day. Yes, it's 445-6786. 445-6786, okay. And do you have a number where you can be contacted outside of office hours? Well, I'm at work till late in the evening, so use the same number, and if I'm not there, you can leave a message. Thanks. I'll make a note of that. And how many guests shall I put down? Okay, that's changed. So instead of the figure I gave you before of 85, it's now only 50. It's much lower, I'm afraid, because a lot of people can't make that date. That's not a problem. Can you remind me of the date we'd set? Yes, it's the 25th of June. Okay, that's fine. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 6 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 6 to 10. Now, did you have the chance to look at the tables on the website? Yes, I did. And I think the rectangular tables would be good. The long, thin ones. Yes, um, you could have two of those. The only problem is that they are for 24 people. So, you'd only seat 48 people that way. And if you have 50 guests... Oh, I see what you mean. Two people have nowhere to sit. What about the square ones? You'd have the same problem with numbers. Usually, for 50 people, we find the round tables work well. Not the smaller ones. They only seat 6 people. The ones that seat 10, the large ones. So do you think we should have 5 of those? I think that would work well. Okay. That's what we'll do then. Fine. And have you decided on the menu you would like? Yes, I think so. But I wanted to ask you, we talked about having the three-course meal with waiter service, but in the end, we thought it would be a bit too formal. So that leaves the buffet or the seven-course banquet. How much is a banquet again? A hundred pounds a head. That's too much and too formal. The buffet is fine. 
Okay, so I think I've got everything. We'd need a deposit of 50% of the total. Right. What's the total? Just a minute. Yes, it's 30 pounds a head times 50. So that's 1,500 pounds. 50% of that would be 750 now, with the balance due another 750 on the day. Great. I'll call in tomorrow if that's okay. I can pay you the deposit then. We'll look forward to seeing you tomorrow then. Okay. Thanks a lot. Goodbye. Goodbye. That is the end of section one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 2. Section 2. You'll hear a guide talking to a group of tourists about Buckingham Palace. First you have some time to look at questions 11 to 17. Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 17. Now, of course, Buckingham Palace is instantly recognisable to millions of people around the world. As we pass the palace, I'd like to tell you a few things about the history of this famous building. We think the first house was built here around 1624. In 1674, that house burned down and a new one was built called Arlington House after its owner, the first Earl of Arlington. Then, in 1703, the first Duke of Buckingham changed the design of the house and the name. It was then known as Buckingham House. The building we see in front of us now has undergone many changes since it was first built. The east front, which is the part we see from the road, was added as part of the work done by Queen Victoria and was completed in 1850. But the palace has remained pretty much unchanged for nearly a hundred years. The last major changes to the structure were made by King George V, who, in 1913, had the east front redesigned as a backdrop to the large memorial to Queen Victoria, which had just been placed outside the palace gates. Since then, only minor changes have been made. I should point out, though, that the palace was bombed seven times during the Second World War, most seriously in 1940, when the palace's chapel was destroyed. Today, of course, it is the home of the royal family, but that wasn't always the case, although they did own most of the land it was built on. It was George IV who turned it into a palace, doubling its size, when he became king in 1820. He had inherited it from his father, King George III, who, in 1761, had become the first royal owner of the building, though it was still not used as the home of the royal family, just as a private home for Queen Charlotte. It was known as the Queen's House at that time. King William IV finished the work after his brother, George IV, died. But King William never moved into the palace. In fact, in 1834, he offered it as a new home for Parliament after the Houses of Parliament were destroyed by fire. The offer was not accepted, though, and in 1837, when Victoria became Queen, the house became the main royal residence in London. However, Victoria and her husband, Prince Albert, found the house too small, so they carried out building work to further enlarge it. This included building the East Front, which I've already mentioned as the part we are looking at now. Victoria was also responsible for moving the marble arch, B, 
built as a part of the palace itself in the 1820s to where it stands today, separate from the palace on the corner of Hyde Park. For 20 years or so, the palace was often the setting for huge banquets, dances and musical performances. This period lasted until Prince Albert died in 1861, after which Victoria spent very little time there and the palace was hardly ever used. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 18 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 18 to 20. When Victoria died in 1901, Edward VII became king. He was responsible for most of the decoration inside that exists today, and the dark days of the later part of Victoria's reign were fairly quickly forgotten as the palace came back to life. The palace has been in continual use by the British royal family ever since. A lot of people ask me if they can visit the palace. One way is if you're lucky enough to be invited to one of the three garden parties usually held every year. As many as 8,000 people attend these, although most of them do not get to meet any members of the royal family and they don't see much of the inside of the palace. The garden is, however, quite spectacular and it is the largest private garden in London with an artificial lake, 30 different species of bird and over 350 different wild flowers, some of which are extremely rare. Inside the palace, there are 240 bedrooms, 92 offices and 78 bathrooms. There are also 19 state rooms, which are used for official engagements and ceremonies. Members of the public are only allowed to visit the state rooms and then only in August or September when the monarch is not there. It's worth it though because there's a lot to see in the state rooms, including examples of some of the world's best art with works by Rembrandt, Rubens and Canaletto. The tour, which lasts up to two and a half hours, ends in the garden, where you can see more of the outside of the palace not visible from the road. That is the end of section two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 3. Section 3. You'll hear two university students discussing a social science lecture they attended. First you have some time to look at questions 21 to 24. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 24. Did you go to the first social science lecture yesterday? Yeah. Didn't you see me there? No. I was trying so hard to understand the lecturer. What didn't you understand? A lot of it, really. For example, he said we needed to study history as part of the course, but I didn't get why. You probably missed it. He said early on that we need to learn from our past mistakes. Right. But he also said we need to put ourselves in the place of our ancestors. Why is that? I think the point is that it's not enough to know how they lived and what they did. We need to know what they thought. I see. And I've written transferable skills in my notes next. 
but I have no idea what that means. If you study social science, you learn skills that you can use in a job. Oh, right. Is that all? Okay, but why is that? The point he made was that in studying social science, you use a flexible and adaptable approach to learning. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 25 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 25 to 30. He also kept mentioning all the other subjects we will need to study as part of the course. I didn't write them all down, did you? Some of them. I think I can make sense of my notes. The first one was anthropology, which he said would cover prehistory and archaeology as well. Okay. Then there's economics. I wrote down that this was not meant to mean that we will spend all our time looking at economic theory, but more that we need to see how humans behave. That's good. I don't think I could handle economic theory. He said something about education too, didn't he? Yeah. He said we'll be looking at how cultural information is handed down from one generation to the next through teaching children. He said we'd be focusing on geography, too, but I can't really remember which aspects. Can you? I noted it down, I think. Here we are, yes, particularly in relation to urban planning. It's law that I got confused about. I didn't understand why he linked that to economics. I think he meant that laws affect the way wealth is distributed. That makes sense. Now, what are the science wars? Okay, I did get that. The science wars are about how social science collects information. In sociology and social work, and in social science generally, they can only study patterns of behavior and observe. If you compare that to the way scientists work in physics or chemistry, it's very different because they use specific experiments that can be tested and which give concrete answers. Social studies is often accused of being unscientific. That's all. Okay. But it still looks like a good course, doesn't it? You don't have any regrets, do you? None at all. I'm looking forward to it. That is the end of Section 3. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 4. Section 4. You'll hear a lecturer talking to students about America in the 1960s. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 37. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 37. We begin our examination of America in the 1960s with the usual caution. There is no sense in trying to understand any decade without looking at what came before. Those of you who still have outstanding coursework on the 1950s would do well to complete it now, if for no other reason, then it will help make sense of the next series of lectures. 
but we must press on. And I'd like to begin my talk about the 60s with a reference to one of those things that came before, the post-war baby boom. With the end of the Second World War in 1945, there began in the USA an era of perceived prosperity and security. In short, people started to feel that the world was a much better and safer place to bring up children. So, at the start of the 60s, all those children born in the baby boom, 70 million in the U.S. alone, were teenagers. As the 60s progressed, and as this large number of people approached adulthood, there was a noticeable shift in the balance of power, and young people began to have a voice in ways that were not considered possible in the more conservative atmosphere of the preceding decade. Things were moving forward at a rapid pace. The literature of the time brought out all the taboos. Everything was covered, such as race in, for example, the book To Kill a Mockingbird. The role of women changed, and uh, equality for women, well, let's just say that once certain books were published, women were no longer going to be satisfied with their roles as devoted wives and mothers. Through literature alone, the whole fabric of society was challenged, and by the end of the 60s, things would never again be as they had pretty much been for the preceding 40 years. It was a decade of protest, civil rights protests, feminism, the rights of minorities, the Vietnam War. All these causes led to peaceful and not-so-peaceful protests on college campuses and elsewhere. People had been given freedom of speech and they were going to use it. The crime rate rose to nine times what it was in the 50s as respect for the old order faded away. But it was also a time of great development. In medicine, the 60s saw the first heart transplant. In technology and the space race, where we saw the first American in orbit and lasers being invented at the start of the decade, and the first man on the moon, and the first primitive internet at the end. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 38 to 40. Now listen and answer questions 38 to 40. None of this, good or bad, might have happened if things in 1962 had gone slightly differently. On October 16th, President John F. Kennedy met with his closest advisors at the White House. They had obtained photographic evidence showing that Cuba was building or installing nuclear weapons. It was widely believed that Cuba was preparing to fire these weapons at cities in the USA. Kennedy was faced with three choices, to try to resolve the crisis diplomatically by negotiating with Cuba and the Soviet Union, to take action to block the delivery of more weapons into Cuba, or to attack Cuba, destroying their weapons. Believing that the first option would end in failure and that the third option would lead to war, it was the second option that Kennedy chose. In doing so, he succeeded in preventing the buildup of more missiles. The Soviet Union then withdrew the weapons from Cuba. Most historians agree that if Kennedy had acted differently, the episode would have led to a full-scale nuclear war between the United States and the Soviet Union. Millions would have died, and the world would have been changed beyond recognition. That is the end of Section 4. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
That is the end of the listening test. You now have 10 minutes to transfer your answers to the listening answer sheet.